course on artificial intelligence. Um, he holds uh, both a bachelor's, master's, and PhD degrees um, in electrical engineering from MIT. And he has a really fascinating talk up ahead and hopefully we're gonna inspire you guys to, to do some great things with your projects. So with that, I'll uh, turn it over to Mark. Uh, just before we get started, um, please uh, feel free to enter questions in the question and answer. And I'm gonna do my best to um, keep up with those during the talk. And then when Mark's done, um, I'll moderate a, a brief Q&A session so you can, um, can, can get more questions answered that way. All right, thank you everyone. And uh, over to you, Mark. Thanks, Jen. Can you see the slides okay? I can, thank you. <clears throat> Great. Well, uh, good morning or good afternoon, uh, everybody. As Jen said, my name is Mark. And what uh, Jen has asked me to do this morning is to give you an overview of what we call the PACT project, Private Automated Contact Tracing. And I'll give you a sense of uh, how we got started, what our mission is, and where we stand. And that hopefully some of this information will prove useful to you as you do this uh, automatic uh, automated contact tracing project this, uh, this summer. So I thought before I uh, jump into that, I would just give you a one slide overview of who I am. So uh, I was born in Chicago uh, in the 1960s and grew up in a suburb called Lincolnwood. My mother uh, was a teacher before she retired and my father was an attorney. <clears throat> there were no engineers or scientists in my family. And so I was really the first, uh, the, the first one like me. Uh, one of my first uh, jobs was uh, to work at a, a neighborhood deli. And so you can see the picture of the corned beef sandwich. I made hundreds, maybe thousands of sandwiches like that. And I graduated from a big public high school called Niles West High School, which is in Skokie, which is uh, nearby where I, uh, very close to where I live. And I just wanted to shout out to uh, Henry Gussis, who's a, a BWSI uh, uh, a student this summer, because Henry goes to the same high school and he'll graduate uh, next year in 2021. I graduated, uh, will have graduated 40 years before then in 1981. Um, I came to MIT in the 80s. I was at MIT for about 10 years, uh, getting uh, an undergraduate as a graduate uh, student. And pretty soon uh, I uh, joined Lincoln Laboratory. So when I, after my sophomore year in, in college, I became an intern and I've been at Lincoln Laboratory really ever since I was 19 years old. So it's been a long time maybe 37 years, uh, all the way through the, the following decades. And I've been there right along. I, I did, uh, as Jen said, I worked in the area of human language technology, which is, for example, how you can extract information from speech, things like who's talking, what they're talking about, what words are being spoken, the kinds of things that today uh, applications like Siri can do. But back in the day, uh, there was no such thing as Siri. Uh, also worked in what's called wideband tactical networking. So for the military, to try to make sure that they can communicate when they're out in the field uh, and not near uh, cellular networks, for example, and also in cybersecurity. And, and during those times, although that was what I was working on mostly, uh, I got to spend a year at the National Security Agency, which was fun. I uh, spent two months in Haiti after the terrible earthquake there in 2010. And I've also served for eight years on something called the Army Science Board, which, uh, which advises the very senior leadership of the Army, the Secretary of the Army and the Chief of Staff of the army, and so this has really been my career. I'm I'm married, and I have uh, I, I have two sons. Uh, my wife and I have two sons. So uh, enough about me. Let's talk a little bit about what contact tracing is. And before we do that, I should say I'm an engineer. Uh, I didn't know what contact tracing was uh, uh, before the end of March. I'd never heard that phrase before. My background is in signal processing and system analysis and building prototypes and and writing software not in epidemiology, but I've learned a little bit and you're gonna hear next week from a from an epidemiological expert, an infectious diseases expert, uh, Dr. Louise Ivers. And she can tell you a lot more about uh, COVID and how it, how, and what, uh, how it uh, moves from person to person and what the issues are much better than I. But I'll give you just a couple slides on this and then you'll hear from her next week to hear more details. The basic uh, problem is that we have what are called index cases so an index case is a, think of that person as a, uh, a sick person, okay? So this is a person that's been exposed to the disease and they, uh, there's a period of incubation, maybe it's a couple days. Then all of a sudden they are infectious, they become infectious. So that happens, I don't know if you'd be able to see my pointer, but that happens right around here uh, in this, the beginning of this blue bar. Uh, but at that point, sometimes their symptoms haven't started. So they haven't started sneezing or coughing or having a fever, but they are infectious. And so when they're 
breathing out or if they were to cough or sneeze, their, uh, they, what comes out of them would be full of the virus. Then the onset of the, of that, now their symptoms uh, uh, onset. So now they, they know they're sick. And then during this period here, they are infectious. And then at some number of days later, they've recovered. Um, the, the problem is that contacts, these index cases come into, uh, come, come close in proximity to contacts. And so, uh, and that can happen at any time. Now, if it happens during this white period here, it's not a problem because they're, they're not infectious yet. It's during, if it, it's when people uh, come in contact with these index cases during this blue bar, that's, a, it's a problem. So we've shown here, for example, this contact maybe um, it, it came into contact with the index case right at the beginning of his infectiousness. Uh, then a few days go by, he's not infectious and then he becomes infectious and this whole thing starts again. And so the, the purpose of, of contact tracing is to find this, these, inf you can't do anything about the index case. That person's sick and there's nothing, you, you try to help that person get better, but there's not much that can be done. What you're trying to do is find these infected contacts the people that came into contact with the index case during the time that he was in, uh, infectious. And you'd like to find that person before they infect others, right? Uh, that's, that's really the whole purpose of contact tracing. And so this is something that's been going on for, I, I'm not sure you can ask Dr. Ivers, let's say a hundred years, something like that. Uh, and and it me, it's an ep epidemiological technique used to identify people who have had contact with an infected person. You can just see this little graphic of how the disease gets transmitted from person to person. The thing is, is that for diseases like tuberculosis, uh, where in Massachusetts, we had about 200 cases last year. So that's like one case a day. It's possible to, um, it's possible to try to figure out, okay, this person has tuberculosis. You go, you make an appointment, you talk to that person, you figure out all the people they were near while they were infectious, try to track those people down, make sure they're okay and try to stop this uh, disease. And of course, there's lots of things you can do to stop tuberculosis. We can treat it, we can vaccinate against it and so on. Um, there are other uses like that with smallpox and sexually transmitted diseases as well. The problem with COVID is that it's, there's just a lot more of it. So in Massachusetts, there was a time maybe a month ago, six weeks ago, something like that, where we were getting 2,500 new cases of COVID every day. And so that's totally different from tuberculosis where you had maybe one case a day in Massachusetts. And then the other problem is that with COVID, you could die in a couple of days, if you're, you know, especially if you're older, you have some pre-existing conditions. With tuberculosis, it takes 10 years for tuberculosis to kill you. So tuberculosis is like a slow motion thing, right? And the existing techniques we have to trace contacts for tuberculosis tend to work. Um, but for uh, COVID, with thousands of people getting it and with it, it moves so fast, it kills you so quickly, um, that, that is, the traditional methods are going to be stressed uh, to, to work. So what are the traditional methods? Well, it's, it's mostly a manual process up until now. Um, and, and so manual means, you know, you use telephones, people, you talk to people on the phone, you might even go visit them, you have Excel spreadsheets, you might even just take notes on a piece of paper. But you're trying to ask, remember the index case, the person who's sick, that person has to remember everybody that they've come in contact with during the time that they were inf uh, infectious. And that's hard. It, maybe it's possible, maybe they can remember some of the people, but not all of them. It's, it's very labor intensive to go through these interviews, lots of opportunities for errors. But the number one problem really is, how about the people that you don't know the name of them? You know you were near people, maybe you were on the subway or something, you were near them on the bus, you might have sat next to them at a, at, a, at a sporting event, but you just don't know their names. And you were yet you were near them for long enough you, and, and, and close enough uh, that they could have picked up the infection from you. And that's really, uh, that was really what motivated, trying to solve that problem is what, is what started the PACT project. So let me tell you about this PACT project. So PACT, P-A-C-T, a private automated contact tracing began uh, at MIT in March of 2020. Uh, and so this began, uh, and so this, is a, this was a conversation between one professor, the institute professor at MIT, MIT has, I think, 10, maybe 12 institute professors. These are the most senior professors at MIT. One is a is probably the world's best photographer. He has developed uh, codes for keeping information secure. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and everybody, every one of us uses uh, uses Amazon codes. That you, you don't know it. Uh, Mark, but the, I'm just yep. going to interrupt you. You all of a sudden got really choppy. Every um, okay. Been all the comments. So I'm um, well. Let's see. How is it now? Oh, you sound much better now. I'm not sure what happened. Okay. 
Okay. Should I just, should I, can I, uh, am I okay on page seven here? Yes, I, that's right okay. when I started. All right, all right, let me know if it recurs. So Ron uh, comes up, this professor uh, has, you know, the, the, the way that we do internet secure transactions with Amazon, even when we uh, just Google search things uh, is all protected. The, the data as it's moving around the internet is all protected with protocols that benefit from the inventions that Ron has made. And so he's what's called the Turing Award winner, which is like the Nobel Prize of computer science. So he was talking to uh, his colleague, Professor Yael Kaley. They were teaching a class to some grad students about, about cryptography. And he thought, and, and it, they were talking about something called the Find My Protocol. And I don't have time to de describe that today, but basically uh, many of you on your iPhones, uh, if, you, uh, if you have share your information with your friends, if you allow it, um, they can track where you are uh, locally, uh, physically, and you can track where they are. And if your phone has a chance of finding it, things like that, these are all part of the Find My Protocol. It's a Bluetooth, uh, Bluetooth protocol uh, that you might be, might be familiar with. And so they were teaching about this protocol and how cool it was. And it was the last class they taught before MIT closed down, uh, shut, shut its doors because of COVID. And they, they had this discussion that said, gee, I wonder if this protocol could be used for proximity detection for the purposes of, of COVID. And so uh, they started thinking about that, talking to other people on campus, and the president of MIT, Rafael Wright, found out about that. And he reached out to the director of the laboratory, who's Ken's boss and my boss, and Lisa and Joel's boss. And, and the two of them talked about uh, having us work together with Ron and Yael. Now, we knew Ron and Yael. We've worked with them. Many people at Lincoln Laboratory had Ron for, uh, for, as their thesis advisor or whatever. So Ron, Ron knew about us. In fact, he had just visited the lab in February. Uh, but we didn't know he was working on this. And so that was very helpful. And so uh, what, what PAC became was this uh, MIT campus-led effort uh, out of uh, the Computer Science and AI Lab, which is CSAIL, and the Internet Privacy Research Initiative, which is a, a, a lab within CSAIL. And, it, and because Ron is so well-known and has so many colleagues around the world that uh, respect him, uh, this became a worldwide collaboration with other teams working on similar techniques. And the, the big focus of PAC is on the P, uh, for privacy, private. That's very important to Ron. He spent his whole career trying to keep, you know, data private and secure. And so um, he wanted to make sure that whatever we came up with could be used for privacy. Lincoln Laboratory got involved with CSAIL on this. Uh, we were able to uh, bring aboard Dr. Louise Ivers. You're going to hear from her next week. She's a doctor, uh, infectious disease specialist, so she treats patients it's a teaching hospital of Harvard Medical School. And so she joined the team because she actually understands this. She, her background in infectious diseases, uh, she's done a lot of work outside the United States, in Haiti, in Rwanda, and elsewhere, where, for example, she had to figure out how cholera came into Haiti after the uh, 2010 earthquake. Uh, and then she had to figure out how to kick it out of Haiti, how to track it out of Haiti. So she's a specialist in how diseases propagate and how you get rid of them. And she's going to talk to you next week. Uh, but she became our senior medical advisor. And then very soon, people like Jen, and you know, Jen leads a, a, a division of 400 people, and I don't know, 25 or 30 people in Jen's division, 25 or 30 people in my division, et cetera. We had hundreds of people working on this project that came out of this idea that. Uh, that uh, uh, Professor Rivest and Professor Kaylee uh, uh, had. So if we go to the next slide, or I guess I can go to the next slide. Um, I'll show you the general. I'll show you the general approach. Now I know you saw this video. Uh, I was told that you saw this uh, a video about this last week, so I'm not going to replay the video. Uh, but the the link is down there, and of course you can click on it later. Uh, this shows the general approach. So today, but without any automated contact tracing, the way things work. Whoops, the way things work is that. You have, people who are very close together. Uh, you have an index case and a contact, and the index case, the guy in red, is gets sick. Um, he gets interviewed by a command center. Now, this used to be, uh, you know, in, in probably in the city hall in Boston or near some big uh, office building in Boston. But now, of course, those buildings are closed, so most of this is done remotely. Uh, by uh, by by, uh, there's about a thousand people doing this work now for the state, plus another thousand or so probably doing them in each city and town total altogether in Massachusetts. So maybe two thousand altogether, and that's just Massachusetts. 
And what they'll do is they'll ask this person, you know, when did you start getting sick? Who have you been near? You know, who is sick in your family? Those kinds of questions. And then they'll reach out to these contacts, the people that this index case thinks he was near. And they will ask those people, how are you doing? Are you feeling sick or whatever? And they'll make some recommendations. Like, you know, maybe you ought to just keep track of your symptoms or maybe you ought to go get tested or maybe you ought to self-quarantine. And so um, that's how the system works today. That's the manual system. That's the system that works well for tuberculosis, for example. What we're proposing uh, is, a, is an adjunct. It's a supplement to that system. So it means that if these two people both had smartphones, and if they were uh, within uh, about six feet of each other, two meters of each other for long enough, and we'll talk about what long enough means, um, they're going to exchange these chirps, as you know, uh, and when this person tests positive, the state will ask them to upload a certain number of people to anonymize the database and anonymize contact. Those people will get contact, but they're not going to be able to be private. These people, if people don't know, it was this particular guy that's the cause of, of, their, of their potential sickness. And then they will be advised, you know, what to do: symptom check, test, self quarantine. So that's the basic approach that PACT is taking. It's implementing this bottom part of what's otherwise a manual system. Um, so if you've been paying attention to the news, you know that these kinds of systems have been implemented in different countries in different ways with different levels of success. And this map is already out of date. Uh, I, I can tell you since last week because it's already changed. But there are some countries. Let me just so they already track where all their people are all the time anyway and when they the chinese government tells their people to do something they do it and so they were very successful in using this kind of automated contact tracing not necessarily with bluetooth but with other means gps and things to help uh, slow the spread of the virus in china south korea did the same thing they're a democracy like we are but their laws are a little bit different uh, they had already been hit with a couple of viruses so they did some, something not quite as drastic as China, but similar, also very effective. Um, but then there are uh, other countries that are a lot more like us, like Australia and, uh, and uh, UK, and they are, gonna, they were, they are using uh, 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 or have planned to use Bluetooth-based proximity detection, but not exactly the way that we do it. Uh, that's just changed. The UK just switched over to what we're going to do in the United States, too. So there are, there are, those are the countries that are in green. And then in blue, uh, are the countries that are very similar, almost identical to what is likely to happen here in the United States. So I, I guess your takeaway from this is, first of all, there's a lot of the world that's not doing this at all. So that's interesting. And then of the places that are doing it, for the most part, they're either going to be red or blue. They're either going to be location-based using things like GPS, which would be you know, pro probably illegal in the United States, unconstitutional. Uh, or they're going to do uh, a Bluetooth-based proximity, uh, a decentralized proximity detection which is, uh, is, is probably uh, legal and constitutional and would work in the United States and lots of other, lots of other places. So every day it'll be a new article about how this is going. A lot of the articles are very pessimistic. I, uh, I, I take more of an optimistic perspective. I think we don't know Mark, whether this is going to work. Mark, I'm going to interrupt one more time. Can you try turning off your video and see if that helps? You just keep going in and out choppy. Uh, turn off the video. Sure. Let's see if I can do that. Hold on. Okay. Let me stop sharing. Oh, I see it. Stop the video. Okay. So now you shouldn't see my video, right? But you yeah, can still see the slides? We, we still see the slides. Okay. They're not in well, slideshow mode, though. Yeah. I'm going to go into slideshow mode. Perfect. Thanks, Mark. Okay. Well, let's see if it goes. If it's really bad, I can also One possibility is that we'll have a system like this. So uh, our phones, in fact, for those of us who have iPhones, uh, it's already on most of our iPhones if you've updated it in the last month or so, uh, they will have changes to the operating system that will permit this, uh, this, this chirping, uh, this, this, uh, this Wi-Fi protocol to detect or hear each other. And we will probably have apps on our phone that will be one app per state, that will be the state's transmitting, and we'll 
So, you know, when this index case, when he gets sick and he sends up his chirps uh, down to this database, um, you know, we'll have an app that will tell us maybe like an Amber Alert or something like that, that will say, hey, you know, a couple of days ago, you were near somebody uh, who uh, tested positive. So maybe you ought to go do something. Uh, so Lisa, how does that sound now? So um, you actually just came back in the beginning. You were really choppy again. So we missed. Okay. Kind of Why don't I try to dial in? Let's, I don't even know if that's possible. It or, should be possible. Let's see. I got a, another option. Well, that's going to be hard. <laughs> um, hmm. Hold on a second. Okay. Sorry for the technical difficulties. Hopefully we can figure it out and move on. But if you have any questions, maybe um, put them in the Q&A and Jen can answer, start answering some of your questions while we're waiting. I'm working on the, some of the answers right now. These are some great questions on centralized and decentralized. Let's see what happens. Let's call this. Well, all right, not so easy to dial in, it turns out. Um, I'm gonna try to keep going. Okay. Uh, how does it sound now, Lisa? Now you sound good. I'm gonna leave it outside of, uh, outside of uh, presentation mode. See okay. What happens. okay. Okay. All right, so uh, this is what it, the interface is gonna look like. So on the left side is what, it, what, what in your state. Uh, so like here in Massachusetts, it might look uh, some, something like this. This is what individual citizens will see. And uh, this is an opt-in system. So if you want to be part of the system, then you can, uh, you can download this app. If you don't want to be part of it, you don't have to. Uh, and then there'll be some kind of dashboard on the right. And this is what they can see in the Department of Public Health in Massachusetts. And they get a for each person and up, uh, you know, who the contacts that they figured out. Really, where that they figured out automatically, and it would give them some overall kind of uh, big picture sense of what's going on in Massachusetts. The real question uh, that people like Jen and other laboratory and at MIT campus and elsewhere have been working on is is this uh, is the problem of of what it means to be too close for too long. So too close for too long. Uh, I don't know what it's like in all the states you you all are in, but in Massachusetts. It's been, six feet, uh, that is two meters or closer for some amount of time, which could be 10 minutes or 15 minutes. It changes in Massachusetts. Even the CDC has changed their guidelines. Um, but let's say it's 10 minutes for, uh, for uh, being, being uh, uh, for 10 minutes or longer being six feet or two meters uh, uh, together or less. That, what that really means is that we want the system to alert if we're in this upper left-hand corner, right? If we're less than two meters, and if it's greater than 10 minutes, that, then the system should alert. Uh, what we don't want, we don't want an alert if we're in any of these green places, 
So for example, a hug or a handshake, by the way, a hug or a handshake if the person sneezes could be devastating, even if that only takes a few seconds. But nonetheless, we, we're not gonna alert on that. We, we might choose not to alert if you're on a subway for one stop in the same car. But if you're side by side at the coffee shop for an hour, we're gonna alert. And it's up to the Department of Public Health, to the Public Health Authority, uh, right, on how, uh, how, how to draw this. And we as engineers, we just have to implement it. So our job is not to figure, the engineers don't figure this out. The engineers get this plot and the public health department says, make this happen. Uh, and that, that, is, uh, that is what has happened. Um, the system that we use, we split up into this packed stack has three components. This is just a model of how this is going to work. There's layer one, which is proximity measurement. So this is the Bluetooth stuff. Uh, this is how we figure out, you know, the blue, we, we see the Bluetooth uh, the advertisements that go out from one phone to another. Uh, and we use receive signals, uh, signal strength to try to figure out how close we are. There's some other tricks to figure out how close we are. Um, that's what this proximity measurement is down here at layer one. Layer two is the fact that the data that gets passed between the phones, these are just random, uh, random numbers. They're not, they're not my phone number, they're not my name, they're not the original version of my name or my phone number, they're just random. And so how the network is back to how works is what we call layer two. And then layer three is up here. So we've got the public health interface in the upper left. Uh, this is where uh, the public health interface is what connects up at the Department of Public Health to their existing systems where you can practice at home. And 3B is the uh, individual interface. So this is the app on the phone. So it turns out that layer one and layer two are being developed by Apple and Google, right? They have been in their operating system. They are implementing both layer one and layer two. And they've done a great job at layer two, and they're working hard to make layer one as accurate as possible. But that's where the, that's where the challenge is in layer one. Uh, up here, layer three. Uh, in the United States, I have something that nobody's done this yet. So, uh, the United States, there are no apps in any city uh, with Apple, Google, uh, exposure notification system. And there are no hooks in the, in the system in any of the departments of the public health and other manual systems. So, that's just beginning to happen. You may have heard of Dakota. Mark, you're all choppy uh, again. Hmm. Oh. Uh, oh, okay. Well, you know, whenever I interrupt you, I don't know what you're doing. Whenever I interrupt you, you go clear. Are you moving your mouse oh, yeah. or anything? No, nope. maybe you should just interrupt me more often. <laughs> uh, I'm going to, um, I'm going to try one more time to dial in just in case okay. that might work. Just how I'm going to write all the information down. So um, we'll just have to do it this way and you'll have to just interrupt me. Uh, okay, okay, Lisa? All right. All right. All right. So this is the stack and uh, uh, folks like Jen and others at their homes uh, took phones around and uh, did a, a lot of measurements within their homes, of, depending on how far apart the phones were, what the various sing signal strength measurements were. Uh, and this turned out to depend very strongly on phone orientation, the location of the phones, whether the phones were in people's pockets and so on. Uh, and unfortunately, what it turned out to be is that 
it, it, no matter what distance people were, the, on the right side, you can see people being near or being far. The energy, the, the amount of, uh, of signal that could get from the one to the other was quite variable. So we wished that it would be a very simple relationship between uh, the energy that went from one phone and actually made it to the other phone uh, and the distance apart they were, right? In a perfect world, that would have been true. If we, if we were in, a, uh, you know, in, a, in, in an antenna chamber with foam, foam walls and so on, in a perfect situation with perfect antennas, that would have happened. But with these phones, they're, uh, they're very complicated. And of course, they're next to people and people's bodies are made up of water. And the way that these phones work, the radio frequency uh, energy that moves between from phone to phone is often absorbed uh, by people's bodies, by their heads and other parts of their bodies. And so it just, it just is very messy. It's not, it, it's not random, but it's very messy. Um, nonetheless, uh, we were able to, to measure, we were able to figure out uh, that um, uh, with, with a lot of work, we could detect when somebody was too close for too long with actually a very low error rate. So, uh, and I'm not gonna go through the details of this chart, but uh, basically 90, about 93 out of 100 times, so 93% of the time, if somebody was too close, we could detect that they were too close, that they were less than six feet away. And 93% of the time, if they were farther away, they were 10 feet away further, we could, we could know that. So that's actually quite good. Uh, and I will tell you that when this uh, technology was used in Singapore, it's very similar to what I'm talking about here. Uh, the automatic systems there were able to detect people, were able to identify uh, people that sick people had been close to. They were able to identify contacts that index cases had been close to that the index case didn't know the name of or wouldn't have been able to remember. So we know from the case in Singapore that this works. We have this kind of data that shows it effectively. We also have data from Singapore where they actually use this operation that, that we know works, even though it's never been used in the United States uh, up until this time. There's a lot of data. Uh, Lisa, how are we doing on sound now? Um, Mark, you were choppy for a bit and now you're not. Okay, it's weird. It is weird. Um, the, uh, I get, well, oh, I'm almost done. So, okay. uh, so at least, at least that's, uh, at least there won't be much more choppy audio. Okay. So the, there's a data repository that is available. So anybody around the world can download our data. Uh, and you can go to that site if you're interested in it and download our data sets. And so um, you probably, I'm assuming that Jen and others will give you access to data through Beaverworks, but you should take a look at these data sets too, because they may be a little bit different and may be interesting to you. It wasn't always safe, and it really still isn't safe to just collect data from humans, uh, especially humans that don't know each other, that aren't part of the same family, because you know, you're not supposed to be too close for too long to people you don't know. And so one of the things we did was use robots uh, to, um, to, collect, uh, uh, to, to collect data, and that process is still underway. You can see these robots on the left. I'm not gonna play it, but there's a video that you can see at the bottom, you can click on, uh, and you can see the robots moving around. And it's actually very interesting. And that will be used to create even more data sets. And um, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, uh, NIST is what they're called, they're gonna be standing up open evaluations. So people anywhere around the world will be able to download the data that we're collecting of, uh, that between these phones. Uh, and we'll try to compete to see who can come up with the best analytic, the best tool, the best software for uh, computing whether somebody has been too close for too long. So we're confident that even if we can't figure out the very best system at, at MIT or at Lincoln Laboratory, uh, somebody around the world, maybe one of you, uh, will come up with a scheme that works well and works the best. And what we're trying to do is, is to get Apple and Google, uh, and we talked to them, in fact, we just talked to them again this morning, to adopt some of these new uh, some of these new approaches, these better approaches for detecting too close for too long. Now, the problem is that Apple and Google also want to make sure that the batteries on their phones aren't only doing too close for too long analytics, right? We want, they want their customers to be able to use the phones for music and talking and web browsing, which is what we all want. So some, there's a trade-off between how much processing uh, can get done uh, on these phones for COVID 
tracking and how much battery gets used. And so that's a big engineering challenge that we're working on together with them. Now, what I've been talking about is trying to get this technology out to um, the states, like the states where you live, or Massachusetts, or Pennsylvania. Um, and that's what we call operational implementation, you know, implementation at scale. But we also are interested in doing some pilots, so some experiments, some smaller scale uh, uh, runs. And we are going to be doing that in some college dorms. We've already started that actually at MIT. Uh, and we're also looking at doing it in a few other places, like uh, uh, maybe some hospitals or business campuses. So that's very exciting. And in, in fact, it's very likely that, one of the, that we may be able to do this at one of the military academies uh, in, the coming, in the coming months. So we're excited about that. And we would learn a lot uh, from doing that. What, what we would learn at, a, at the Pentagon or at a university or at a hospital would be directly applicable to you know, pushing this out to the whole world. There's been a lot of accomplishments that the that the team has uh, uh, that the team has had. Um, we hold conferences. The videos for those conferences, the recordings are available. The last one was uh, opened by Governor Baker, who's the governor of Massachusetts. We uh, serve the PAC team serves as a trusted technical advisor to the CDC, which is the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in Atlanta. So that the big U.S. national, the federal level disease control organization. And also we serve as advisors to states like Massachusetts and Pennsylvania, but also to Apple and Google, uh, where we're doing a lot of technical research for them to try to make sure that they can build the best possible system. And there's a lot more things to do. Um, we've been talking about Bluetooth and that's what you guys I think are gonna be working on. But there are also other um, technologies that, uh, that can be used. Um, one is ultrasound. So it turns out that with ultrasound, which is sound that's just a little bit higher than most people can hear, higher in frequency, but you know, like dogs can hear and so on. Um, that turns out to actually be able to do too close for too long much better than Bluetooth. It has other problems, but its, it's uh, accuracy is much better. Um, there are also, also, we've been looking at what are called wearables or tokens, or think of Fitbits and that might be able to do this for people who don't have iPhones, maybe because they're poor or because they're old or because they're young or because they're in you know, a business setting where you can't use an iPhone or, or an Android phone. And there's a few other things we've been looking at as well. So there are many advanced concepts uh, that, are, uh, that we're looking at right now. So I'll just close and I, I guess I'm sorry that the audio wasn't so good, but hopefully you've, you've got access to the slides here. And you can see that, that this contact tracing uh, which, is, which when combined with other things like testing, meaning testing if somebody's sick, uh, if they've got the virus and quarantine, uh, should all help reduce the spread of the virus. And these automated contact, uh, this automated contact tracing really is not a silver bullet. It doesn't stand by itself. It can only supplement manual efforts. And we think it's got a lot of potential, but we really haven't proven it yet. Uh, but nonetheless, we are, we are optimistic our team at MIT, at Mass General Hospital, at Harvard Medical School, at Lincoln Laboratory, is really seeking to advance uh, the state of the art. And so our job, you know, not, not Google. They're, they're the ones that own the phones and will put the software in the phones. We're not replacing the Department of Public Health. We're not making an app. Our job is to be a technical advisor to all of these folks uh, and to be a, a center for collecting and sharing uh, data and best practice. So I'll stop there. All right, Mark, thank you very, very much. Um, that, was, that was great. I think the slide deck was great. And um, the students are definitely very, very curious. There are a lot of questions here. Um, I've been keeping up with some of the questions, but there one common theme um, is, is if, what the difference is between um, centralized and decentralized contact tracing. Could you, so I've given them a little bit in the, in the Q and A, but maybe you could expand on that. Yeah, sure, I can. So, um, th so this is a, it's kind of a religious war as to what's what's better or what's or, or what's worse. Um, the in let me describe decentralized contact tracing. It all has to do with where the chirps go and where the chirps get get processed. So, in a decentralized system, uh, when I if I get sick and I'm asked to upload the chirps that I've broadcast, 
um, the, the, those will go up into a database. Um, and then uh, like Jen, if Jen is uh, just a resident of uh, Massachusetts like I am, and she has the app on her phone, then maybe once a day or some number of times each day, she will go to um, uh, her phone, will download all of the chirps, the seeds really that go with those chirps. Uh, will we'll download all those seeds into her phone and she will compare all of those, call them sick chirps, to all of the chirps that she's heard over the last 14 days. So that comparison happens on Jen's phone. And it's called decentralized because Jen is one of you know, 7 million people in Massachusetts. And if everybody had this app on their phone, then that comparison process would happen in every all 7 million people's phone, right? That's why it's called decentralized. The centralized approach says, well, um, no, that's not what we're gonna do. We're gonna, yes, when you're sick, you're gonna send up the chirps that, that you sent, that's great. But I also want everybody to send up all the chirps that they heard uh, every day also. And, and the centralized system, the one, you know, think of it as the, some, some computer center in Boston is gonna do all that matching. Uh, and it will then tell Jen whether or not she's been near somebody, it will know. And it will go back to Jen and say, Jen, sorry, bad news. Yeah, I'm not gonna tell you who you were near, but you were near somebody who is um, who's sick. And so um, the, the, so, so you would say, well, what's, what's the difference? Between, between those two things? I mean, why does it matter? And I guess um, uh, Professor Revest would say, and others would say that the distributed approach is, um, it's more private because the only time I, 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 I share anything is I sh if I'm sick and if I choose to, I share the chirps that I've sent out and that's it. The person who, uh, who the contact doesn't have to share anything. So that makes it very private. If something goes wrong, if somebody breaks into the database, all they can see, I mean, it shouldn't matter. All those chirps just are random bits of data and they're not connected to anybody. So that's, that seems seem more private to Professor Avest and to all of his colleagues. And I, I guess I kind of agree. The countries that do centralize, uh, like the UK is about to change, but the UK is one, uh, Singapore is another, Australia was another. Um, they, there were two big problems. So one was a political problem and one is a technical, one, one is the real problem. The political problem is that, that really they can know who is sending those trips. It's just not as private. They can figure out who the sick people are and they like that idea. They wanna know that. They say, look, we're a public health department. We ought to know who's sick. That, that's just the way it is. Uh, we're not gonna track people's GPS, but we wanna know who these people are who are sick. And so those countries made that argument and they said, and by the way, we're not interested in what Apple and Google tell us we can do. We will do what we want to do. Uh, Apple and Google said, no, you won't. Uh, we will not let you use our system that way. And so they don't. And so if any country that runs a centralized system, it just doesn't work. Uh, it doesn't work as effectively. So especially on the iPhones, it is really hard to run a centralized system when you're fighting the operating system as opposed to working with it. And that's why the UK is going to switch over. Singapore, they may get away with it and they may choose not to do that. But, but in the long run, almost every country is going to go with a decentralized system because that's the only system that Apple and Google will permit. Because for Apple and Google, this is a nightmare. They, they, don't, want to, they don't want to be doing contact tracing. They want to be selling music and selling phones and selling cool apps. And yet they've been forced into this. And they, and they don't wanna do anything that would compromise the privacy of their customers. Like Google compromises the privacy of its customers all the time. It's just, that, uh, Apple doesn't. It's just that Google does not wanna do that for contact tracing. For contact tracing, they wanna be squeaky clean. And they are, and Apple is squeaky clean. And these countries that wanna compromise, Apple and Google just won't have it. And so that's the way it is. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's great. Thanks. That was very, very clear explanation. Um, another question that came in is where will the database of anonymized contacts be stored and what methods will be used to make sure that the transfer from the infection certification to the database is secure and maintains anonymity? Right. So good question. So it could have been that Apple and Google could have raised their hands and said, uh, we're going to maintain the database. There'll be one worldwide database. That would have actually, I think, been a good idea. It didn't happen that way. So every state has to pay somebody, you know, an IT company to maintain that database for them. And so that's, uh, that's hard, but that, that costs some money, but fine, whatever. 
And then those databases are going to have to be synced up because like the Lincoln Laboratory, we have people come down from New Hampshire every day. And so if somebody gets sick and they tell, they find that out in New Hampshire, you know, somehow the Massachusetts database has to be updated and, you know, how's that going to work? So that has to all be worked out. Uh, and then, then it's a good question. Uh, how, how do we, you have to certify that the chirps, the seeds that go up have to be certified because otherwise bad guys could false alarm the system and they could say they're sick when they're not and they could cause havoc. So the, we've thought about, for example, QR codes that would be one-time QR codes that the Department of Public Health would uh, provide to each testing organization. And so when they say, Mark, you're sick, press this button on your phone, but before you do it, scan this QR code and we'll send that QR code up with your chirps. And then the database would know that it was legitimate, that I was authorized. If I send my chirps up without a QR code that was good, you would just ignore them. And so I think that's pro something like that is what's going to happen. Great. So there, there are some questions here on um, a specific to the project. And um, in the Bravo, maybe I can like, take a crack at answering some of these. So how does PyPact fit into all this? And Mark, we'd like to get your take on this as well. I'll give you my, um, my two cents. Um, and should we um, test the pies under portable conditions? So for, for um, for that, I would say yes, test them under any conditions, you know, see what you can do and see where your, your approaches break down. Where does PyPact fit into all of this? This is an incredibly hard project. So I'll tell you, you know, privately, not privately, um, there's, a, there's a picture in Mark's brief of a dining room and a home. That was my daughter and that was me trying to get our arms around how hard this, this, pro this problem is. Um, and this is something that like, we just want to see what you can do. There's no right or wrong answer. We've been hammering away at this for a couple months, but I know there's a lot of um, innovative, creative ideas that you guys can come up with. So I, I'm just really curious and excited to see what kind of out of the box things you can come up with. Um, and you, earlier in the, in the Q&A, there was a question of, well, could you enter, is it in your pocket or is the phone in your shirt? And that is like critical. That's one of the, things we found was really a critical um, separation uh, in, in the distributions of the signals. So, um, so what is, whatever you guys come up with, we're, we're watching and, and, you know, if you have some great ideas, we'll bring them to the PAC team for sure. Yeah, Mark, I, I, would, I would just add on, Jen, to what you said. So um, I, you know, uh, with our colleague, Bob Shin, who's the director, the founder of BeepleWorks, uh, we've always been, I'm sure you have been too, Jen, always been impressed with what both the BWSI, the high school level, and the main Beaver Works part, the, the undergraduate level, students have come up with. And, and I, you know, without going into all the details, it's, it's definitely true that Beaver Works, that the ideas that have come out of Beaver Works, whether at the high school level or at the college level, have already had impact uh, uh, on, on both national security on the one hand, uh, and also just on, on the commercial marketplace. And the, you know, a lot of stuff has been patented and that it's just changed the, the, the way the technology roadmap uh, uh, played out. So uh, Bob's idea always was that um, you know, students are smart and they'll come up with things that, that uh, practicing engineers who've been doing the same thing for 30 or 40 years uh, just won't be able to see. And I think that that's true. And I think so we're very, open and very excited about uh, what you all do. And I think that it's quite possible that uh, something that you think of uh, that whether, and it could be on any part of this, it could be in the Bluetooth processing, it could be in the cryptographic layer, whatever it might be, will we'll change, uh, we'll change what we end up doing. And uh, I know that Professor Avest uh, would feel exactly the same way. And I, I think that, uh, you know, we're just uh, very excited about uh, the, the project you, you all are about to do. We'll be watching very closely. Great, thanks. Um, another question, what are your thoughts on the rotating key encryption from Apple and Google? I think that what they do is very good. We have, we have almost no, um, no issues with layer two. The, the way that they do layer two is, is almost exactly uh, what was in the PAC specification. The, of course, there's always the devils in the details. There's always things can be slightly different. Uh, as I said, I was just on a call with them. You know, they, we were arguing, not arguing, but discussing down in the minutia uh, of, of exactly some of those things. So we're not, but layer two is good. It's solid. It will be good. It's layer one. Layer three is just engineering. Layer two is where crypto is important, but it's good. Layer one is where the problem is. And that, that is, you know, getting, getting that too close for too long to work with Bluetooth. And if it can't work with Bluetooth, then shifting to something like ultrasound 
is what is, is where the big technical challenge is. Okay, I think we have time for maybe one or two more questions. If, um, if there are others that are come in, you can type them in the q and I think we've talked a little bit about um, what happens as you cross state boundaries um, and centralized versus decentralized. Uh, how are the chirps randomized and made anonymous? So uh, it turns out that, that um, and I'll talk about it at a high level, you can read the spec at a lower level, um, but basically there are random seeds that are, uh, that are uh, present in each, that are created in each phone. Uh, and those um, seeds can be used to generate what are called pseudo random numbers. So they're not, you know, nothing's perfectly random, but these are numbers that for cryptographic purposes are random. Um, and those are, those, there's nothing about the phone or the person using the phone that, that has anything to do with the generation of those numbers. And those numbers change, uh, I've forgotten exactly how often, it, it was once every half hour, once every two hours, I think it's every 15, 15 minutes, minutes or whatever so. it is. And those numbers, so they change frequently, but if you know the seed, you can know what, what that number would have been as a function of time. And so um, when you're listening for chirps, uh, what, what you can't do, what's, what's hard to do is to go, um, is to go backwards. You can't, you can't use the chirps to figure out the seed, but if you know the seed, you can figure out the chirps. And so when you listen for the chirps that you, uh, that, that you heard, um, and then later on, what they will send you are the seeds, basically, uh, from the sick people phones. And what you will do is take those seeds. You'll know for the last 14 days what the chirps would have been that the sick people person would have uh, sent you. And then you match that up with the chirps you actually heard. And you might think that oh, that's a lot of chirps to remember. It might take a lot of memory or a lot of compute time. But actually, it, these phones are so fast and have so much memory, that's actually not a problem at all. Okay, let's see. By the way, I, I should point out, I didn't mean, uh, uh, I'm looking here at the chat, I didn't mean to throw Google exactly under the privacy bus, um, but I think it's fair to say that uh, Apple, I think it's fair to say Apple does not sell our data. Google sells our data. That's how they, that's how they make money. If it, you know, if it's free, then we're the product. Uh, and, and so, um, but what I will say is that on this project, Apple and Google, Apple and Google on this project are like mom and dad. They, there is no daylight between Apple and Google when we ask them questions or we ask them to do something or whatever. It's not like we can go ask mom and if she says no, we can go ask dad. They speak <laughs> one voice and it's a very intelligent, mature, a privacy loving voice uh, and health loving voice, right? They, they want, th these are, even though these two companies are fierce competitors, they, in this case, they are working as close together as if, at least it looks like to us, as if they were the same company. And, and they're doing everything right. They really are. And the only issues we have are always just trade-offs between how good we can make this work and how much battery it's going to cost and how much trouble it's going to be to change the operating system and how much testing that's going to take. So these are all reasonable engineering things. So I may have used words that made you think that, um, that, that uh, I don't respect the, their, the, their love of privacy. It's not true. It's just Apple and Google have different business models and, and that's okay. Um, but for this project, it's, it's, it's the best it could possibly be. And we're so fortunate and we're grateful uh, that, they, um, that, that they are working with us and that they're listening to, that we're not the only ones they're working with, but that they're working with us and they're listening to what we're saying. We're very grateful. Okay, so maybe we can take one last question and that relates to ultrasound. Do you encourage trying uh, out ultrasound? And if ultrasound works better at proximity detection, why not use Bluetooth as a supplement? Great, great, great question. So Jen can speak to whether using ultrasound is in scope or out of scope uh, for the BWSI project. Maybe you wanna do that first. Uh, so I think the priority should be on the Bluetooth, but if you have ideas and you wanna play around, uh, right on the packed side, um, the problem with the, the the problem with ultrasound. There are two problems with ultrasound. Um, one problem has to do with battery usage. So as you probably know, uh, the way Bluetooth works on these phones is that Bluetooth transmissions are almost free. You can do that all the time. It uses almost no battery power. What cost battery is listening for Bluetooth, and that's why they're only listening. I think every five minutes, and it's like only for a few seconds every five minutes. With, um, with ultrasound, both transmitting and receiving cost battery time. 
And so you'd probably would, maybe you'd use the Bluetooth to figure out when to listen for the ultrasound. Um, and, and that people have been demonstrating that on the MIT campus. They've been demonstrating that uh, who, what, you know, CMU has been doing that. Uh, we've been doing it at Lincoln. Um, and what you'll find is, but, but if you do it, you'll find that it works great. The problem is, is the battery usage. But then the other problem is that, well, first of all, to get the battery usage down to an acceptable level, they'd have to make some significant changes to the operating system of both Apple and Google, which they may not be willing to do, we don't know. Uh, some of it will never be as good as Bluetooth because Bluetooth is supported by specific integrated circuits in the, in the uh, low energy integrated circuits in the, in the phones that, uh, for which there is no support for ultrasound. Um, but then the other problem is just the perception. So ultrasound uses the microphone. And so you'd have to turn the microphone on and off. And that would probably have to be done in the operating system. And for a lot of people, hearing that Apple and Google are turning your microphone on and off doesn't, might, doesn't make them feel warm and fuzzy, right? They're like, oh, you're going to turn the microphone on and you're going to spy on me, whatever. But the reality is that Apple and Google already turned the microphone on and off just to make your phone work, just to make it so that you can make phone calls, just to make it so that, you know, Siri works and, and hey, Google and et cetera. So we're already trusting Apple and Google with the, with the microphone as it is. So probably it's true that having them, if ultrasound really worked better and if we could solve the battery problem, then maybe we could convince ourselves, we, I could probably convince myself that it wasn't an additional privacy risk. But um, the rest of the world, you know, when I explain this to, to, uh, to people, they really don't understand how the Bluetooth works. They think it's GPS. They're very concerned about the, you know, they just think we're tracking them. And so if you tell them, if you could, it's very hard to get them to even understand the, that the Bluetooth proximity is not a tracking system. And so then if you tell them you're gonna be turning the microphone on, it just goes from bad to worse. And so you have an even bigger privacy problem, privacy perception problem, not a real privacy problem. And so I'm not sure we'll ever get there. All right, Mark. Well, thank you very much for joining us today. This was a great talk and I hope um, all of you uh, you know, enjoyed it and learned a lot. And um, we'll we'll keep uh, we'll keep uh, with our seminar series. We'll start again uh, next Monday, where we have Dr. Louise Ivers from Mass General Hospital, and she's going to talk about um, the public health side of PACT and contact tracing and and it, where it fits in. Okay, so 